who can who can tell me what we talked last class? Formalisms. Formalisms, exactly. So I showed you how people represent knowledge on several areas, different approaches. Okay? So now we will I will present you because I talked about semantic web several times here, but just on the boundaries, on the on the frontiers. Now we go deep. What is exactly semantic web? So now let's go deeply on the thing. So the motivation, I, I talked a lot about that. I will just jump quickly. But the motivation is I talked about that. If you are, for example, consider you are looking for something on the web. So you want to find the books, uh, some books on the web, uh, uh, which has some kind of uh, subject, author, and title. And so the web has the HTML model, which is for humans, right? And it's hard for a machine to read, interpret, and, and, and do something with these things, right? So, um, we can see the information because we are intelligent, we can recognize images, but machines cannot do that. Okay, and uh, the machines see what? See the codes of formatting and this stuff, which is not interesting for them. Okay, so the web in the beginning was for human consumption, right? So humans are the guys who consume the things on the web. So there is a wide use of natural language. But the semantic web, the basic notion is web for con machines consumption. So we need better structures for machines. So if you want to represent things, we uh, started think about XML. So we talked about XML, which is the basis of semantic web, right? And when we move it from the semantic web, we think that we see that uh, we can uh, use tags in XML to represent, for example, consider we have a tree in the HTML, which is the previous one. We will tell about the characteristics, visual characteristics of the tree, right? So HTML is for presentation, colors, position, size. And when we move it to XML, we can use a tag just telling this is a, a tree, right? But I showed you that there are limits because these tags, to define the semantics of these tags, we have problems and we discussed about semantics here. Right, so uh, we are, but but it, it's a red some kind of advantage because in the HTML we are just talking about tables, font, reference, but there is nothing about the content itself. The content is in a natural language, and when we move it to XML, we can use tags which. Tell something about the content, title, author, book, and so on and so forth. So we have some advantages, and we discuss it. Limitations of XML, you remember that? That we can have several ways, for example, the same thing, type, for example, you want to represent a book in XML. You can do the same thing in several ways. Okay, so I can represent in this way. And we can use different tags. For example, one can use tags in English. Author, title, book. And uh, how the machine can interpret book, title, and author. So we discussed the idea of explicit semantics. What? How machines will, will understand that? Because we are considering that machines are consumers on the web. The machines enter on the web. Starting browsing things and reading things. They must get something and interpret it by itself. It's not something that someone will explain to the machine. Okay? So you may imagine that someone can use another tag in Portuguese, for example, and 
There is no standard way to relate book to livro, title to título, author to author. There is no way in XML to tell these things are the same thing. They are equivalent. Okay? And there is also, uh, for example, uh, other kinds of problems. For example, even, even if the guy uses English, okay? Yeah, we can have more general terms like publication is ge more general than book, okay? Or creator is more general than author. And how can we define relations? What's the relation between book and publication? What's the relation between author and creator? So these is are problems we didn't solve in XML, okay? And another problem we already saw here in the class. I'm just reviewing that, but if someone wants more detail, you can ask me, is we can get something and represent the same thing in XML in several ways. So, for example, this, this phrase, uh, Mr. Horace is author of the page in this address. In XML, it can be represented like that, or like that, or like that, or like that. So, I can have millions of schemas to represent the same thing. So, there are no standard way to define and to represent things. So, one problem is there are more than one approach to represent things. We have what we call the dilemma of elements and attributes, which is the same in what, who is asked, is the same in graph databases if you use, for example, a property graph. You have the dilemma between nodes and properties, okay? And you don't have, there is no way to answer the question, which is the better way to, to do the representation. There is no answer to this question. For this reason, people do different approaches. And in the semantic web, what we need, we are talking about machines talking with machines. So if we talk, if machines talk with machines, we must consider that machines will read and interpret things. So, uh, which are basic notions in the semantic web? The first thing is what we call explicit semantics. This is an important word in the semantic web. Explicit semantics. So put that in your mind because People sometimes write papers about semantic web and they tell things that no, doesn't make sense. For example, people write something and tell, okay, XML doesn't have semantics. This is not true. Okay? Everything in the world has semantics. Everything has semantics. Okay? This table has semantics. Okay, everything has semantics because semantics is something when you consider someone who is interpreting something. So everything, every bit, every byte has semantics. The problem is not ha if it has or not semantics. This is not the problem. The problem is does the semantics is explicit and explicit semantics is the problem. And I will show you what I mean by explicit semantics. I'm considering that you have a wide uh, culture. And you probably know the book 100 Anos de Solidão. You know that? 100 Years of Solitude? Gabriel Garcia Marques? No? No? Oh my God. Yes? Huh? Yeah. For this reason you are a, a happy person, right? Because if you don't read this book, you will not be a happy person. This is a mandatory book for a person. Okay? Mandatory. If you didn't read it yet, go to your home and start reading today. No, just kidding. But it's an excellent book. It's one of the best books I read in my life. Okay? 100 Years of Solitude of uh, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marx. Right? So this is a, uh, it builds a, a, a city, Macondo, uh, and the city is a kind of summary of the world. It is a kind of uh, 
Okay, and one important thing in this city is the following. One day, someone enters in the city with a disease. Do you remember that? That people start to forget things. It's a long time ago. Oh, God, don't tell this thing. Okay, don't tell this thing. Okay, uh, one day, one small girl enters in the city with a disease. Which is disease is people start forgetting things. And this disease is spread on the city. Okay? And then, uh, how to live? Because everybody is forgetting things. How will you live? Okay? So, Aureliano has the idea, the solution. It started to put labels on the things. For example, there is a clock, so it puts uh, an etiquette. Clock. There is a cow, it puts an etiquette in the cow. Cow and tree and everything. So it's solved it because now you don't need to remember. It's written. It's just read it. But then the problem becomes more complicated because people see a call, but they don't know how to do with this call. What I do with a call or with a clock? So they have a better solution. You must write the instructions. So you put on the call. Okay. This is a call. Okay. And you must, I don't know how to tell ordenar in English, but you must ordenar every day in the morning to produce milk, which uh, you mix with coffee to to do coffee and milk. Okay, so all the city has instructions. <laughs> this is a really interesting book. Okay, so the thing is, why I'm telling you about this book? Because this is the semantic web. But who is reading this? The machines. So, you may imagine a tree. If you are a human being, you see the tree and you have a kind of complex processing image in your mind and you recognize it and tell this is a tree this is a human being right if this is a robot the robot has a powerful algorithm that see the tree process and blah 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 blah, blah and tell this is a tree but no in this both case it's not the semantic web we don't want people reading we are not considering people reading we are not considering intelligent machines with complex algorithms to recognize things. Semantic web is that. We put <laughs> something in the tree telling. This is a tree. Okay? <laughs> and this is explicit semantics. Explicit semantics. You put there the table so the machine comes there. Don't need any kind of special algorithms and know, okay, this is a tree. Good. Fair enough. This is explicit semantics. But how we do that? This is the problem, right? Okay. So the first step to do this thing is, is controlled vocabulary. And I already told you about that, right? What's the controlled vocabulary? They must be controlled and universal. Okay? So a controlled vocabulary is the most effective... Oh, Sorry, La lazy tells that the most effective com communication occurs when parts involved agree on the meaning of the terms being used. This is powerful because one problem is if we just put words like I showed you, author and creator and blah 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 blah. Okay, and you are, you are considering that two parties are communicating. Okay? Uh, how can these two parties agree on the terms? Okay? How we do, do we agree? Okay? If, for example, uh, I remember that people ask me uh, an inter interesting thing. When you, you, you are teaching programming, okay? you are teaching programming, and you must give a name to a function. You, you start this teaching functions, okay? And people ask me, but why I need to put in the function, okay, this specific name telling what the function will do? 
and I will tell. You can put in your function whatever name you want. Okay? The program will compile and it will work. But you may imagine the following. You may imagine the following. You may imagine that you open some kind of business to sell bread. Padaria. I don't know how to tell in English. You know but padaria in English? I don't know. But something to sell bread. Okay. And then you put, instead of putting a table to tell that you are selling bread, you put farmacia. <laughs> okay. What will happen? People will go there to buy medicines, not to buy bread. Because it's wrong. Okay. So this is the essence of agree in the meaning. We must agree that this term is for something. But the problem, the first problem is to agree. We must have a universal way to identify. To universally agree, we must have a universal way to identify. Okay? And this is the role. Okay, so. See some other things that are important. Control of vocabulary is a way to insert an interpretive layer of semantics between the term and the user. Okay, so they consider that one step towards the explicit semantics is control the vocabulary. Okay, so uh, there are several ways, okay, to do this controlled vocabulary. Okay. But uh, one thing that Tim Berners-Lee tell in his paper that you must read it, that is semantic web is URI is the key. Everything on the semantic web is identified by URI. Okay? So this clock in this real world, in the semantic web world, has an URI. I have an URI. Everything has an URI. Okay. So the URI is the anchor that connects everything. That defines the way to define controlled vocabularies. For, for example, so. Consider I want to consider a title of something. Instead of using the word title, I will use an URI. Which is universal. It's unique. It's the same. So everybody who wants to refer to a title we refer to this specific URI. Okay? So, in our case, consider we have a bunch of several tags. What is the solution in the semantic web view? Everybody now will refer to the same URIs which defines to the, sim to the symbols. Okay? So, you may imagine that I have a, control, a central vocabulary and everybody you use the same URIs. So when the machines arrive in this place and which use the same controlled vocabulary, it has a way to know which words are has been used in this place. Okay? So everybody will refer to the same terms. Okay? Got it? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Exactly. What you mean is, how can I guarantee that someone will define some vocabulary and the word... The, the right, but it's happening right now. 
Okay, so let me give you some examples. The basic idea of cement web is exactly what you think. It's organic. There is no central guy. There is no big boss. So nobody can tell you this is the vocabulary and everybody will use it. The imposition, not the imposition, but the vocabulary, they will grow in importance according to the ability you have to spread your vocabulary. And so it is in this sense, okay, this the idea. So everything in the semantic web is organic. Everything. Everything. So they design it from the scratch to be organic. Because the web is like that. Okay? There is no boss. And this is this is strange, but this is the idea. So the basic idea is if there is no boss, why I use this vocabulary? So the first the first um, how can I say the first uh, incentive is the first incentive is uh, if we sh we share the same vocabulary, okay, our machines will interoperate, okay. So this is the incentive. But uh, who will be the the guy that defines it? So the thing is, usually several persons start. I am the guy. I am the guy. I am that. So everybody thinks I am the guy. Okay, this is the thing, and it happens like in the natural world, natural selection. The most will die, and this is happens here. Several will die, and uh, a, a small part of it will survive, and this small part of survivors will convince the others to use their. Vocabulary. So it's more or less like that. So let's consider Dublin Core I show here. Dublin Core is a perfect example. Okay. So Dublin Core, what is Dublin Core? It was a, a, a conference where people agreed, let's propose a standard vocabulary of 15 terms. Okay. Is, you can see, you can tell, okay, it's one proposition like many others in the epoch. Okay, but this was the survivor. For some reason, they are, they have the best proposition. Why? Probably because it's simple. It's really simple. Because they did an excellent selection of terms. So it's highly relevant terms. Because they published a site with information and so on and so forth. So what happened? A kind of uh, cascade effect. The first group started and then some important groups start to adopt. And then it becomes a cycle. Today, the, these 15 terms probably are used in 90% of the ontologies I know. Okay, because, for example, one is title. Everybody has title. Okay, so it's a, a good idea, but I mean, it's an excellent uh, proposition. And this, so this will happen, is happening now every time. Sometimes the imposition is based in your authority. So, for example, there are NASA has an ontology and several people adopt it because it's NASA. Okay? And there is this bioontology now has some kind of uh, importance and they publish so people use them. So in some sense now, what I tell to people that uh, uh, design ontologies is the following. First step, you must see if exists a red exists some ontology. Okay? Okay. Because if your red exists, try to use it. If you don't use it, you have two possible solutions. First, and in 99% of the case, you will die. <laughs> and you will work will be nothing. Because nobody will, okay, let's just get this poor student and no. Nobody will do that. Second, you are a genius and you kill everybody. And but this I'm considering if it not, it, it, ex, there are existing ontologies because in some case you can discover uh, uh, something that nobody did an ontology. So now you are the founder. founder. But if there exists an ontology, there is just one reason to produce a new one. If you are 
much better than the other and you tell, okay, I will, I will do better. It happens, but you must be really, really... So this is the thing. It's a kind of organic. It seems strange, but it's working. But there are other things you see now. The thing is, and, and it's your problem, I cannot guarantee that there will be just one vocabulary. And this is one problem. Okay? And it happens. And in several areas we have more than one vocabulary. This is, this is the humanity. It's us. We don't agree on the things. We are kind of fighters forever. Okay? So, but still we have ways to solve that. What's the, what's the solution? The following. The solution is the following. Consider we have two vocabularies. Okay? So we have a group that are using uh, the vocabulary in Portuguese and there are another group that is using the vocabulary in English. Okay? So we have ways in the semantic web, so there are two groups, right? We have ways in the semantic web to tell that one thing is the same thing of other things. Okay? So we call alignment. Since the vocabularies are URIs, okay? You can plug one to the other. It's a graph. Okay? And I think I showed you there is a service on the web, for example, called same as. You can go there and ask, is there something that is equivalent to that? Okay. So, what is the problem here? Who can tell me what's the problem in this solution? Someone new risk? Huh? No, this is a solution, but there is there is a, a collateral effect here. What is this? Yeah, this is the performance. The performance is the drawback. Or say, okay. It means if you do that and you want to follow these things, each time you want to do an inference and so on and so far, you must go and look on the synonyms and so on and so forth. But in this, uh, in, in the last week in Spain, I see a work that's trying to solve that. They are doing kind of caches, local caches and so on and so forth. So they are looking for solutions to that. Instead of just, oh, this is not working. Let's try to do that, but let's try to produce strategies, algorithms to improve the performance, which is the drawback. Okay? Okay. And the interesting thing is this term that I'm telling is the same thing. Also, this term is defined in a controlled vocabulary. So I have a controlled vocabulary telling you what is the meaning of this edge that connects two things that's telling me this is the same thing of the other thing. Okay? But, but, you are, we are humans and we are really uh, specialists in creating problems. Okay? So it's not finished yet because it's not just this, the same thing is a problem. Sometimes people use like book and the other guy use publication. And publication is not exactly the same thing of book because publication is much more general and book is much more specific. And now, what can I do? Okay? There is something we call taxonomic relationships when we can tell, okay, book is more specialized than publication. It's a kind of publication, but it's more specific. Okay? Author or is a specialization of creator. So I can define, still, I can define relations among terms, telling this is more specific, that this is more generic, and so on and so forth. So the machine, for example, let's consider, I have a machine looking for publications. If the machine finds a book, is a book a publication? Yes, of course. So it can do what we call inferences. It can read something and can infer that something else. So this is the idea of taxonomies. Okay? Are you following that? Okay. So then, 
uh, in using these things, a controlled vocabulary, and doing semantic relations among terms, we can start to build our semantic web. Okay? But the semantic web is not just that, because until now, we are talking about graphs and graphs and graphs and, and these things connected. But in fact, there is much more on that. The graphs are founded on the other layers of semantic web. So the graphs become things below. And we must understand how these things happen. Okay? So, for example, we are discussing here. REF is a good model, how it works. It's, it has a lot of... Uh, it's a prolix model, right? When you start to put in a database, it gets too much space and so on and so forth. So, you must remember, I showed you, Semantic Web is a stack. Okay? And the upper technology goes, is mapped on the bottom technology. So, I show you that XML is founded on Unicode and URI, but also RDF and RDF schema that we are looking now are founded on top of XML. And this is a strange thing, because XML is something else, right? XML is uh, a hierarchical model, okay? And RDF is a graph. They are completely different. And this is an interesting thing, because in the beginning, it's not so clear. I started to work with these things, really, really in the beginning. And the first text I read of RDF is, was the specification. Because there is no manual, there is no text, because it's just in the beginning. They are starting to find, and someone gave me the text. Read it. This is really good. It's a colleague in Salvador. He gave me, read it. This is really good. And we, the first specification, everything of RDF was in XML, because it was built on top of XML, and they explain RDF in XML. It is hard to understand, because RDF is another model. How it is defined in, the, in XML, it's really hard to understand. Then, in the development, and not, not just RDF, but also OWL, okay, which is the... So, what they are trying to do, the XML is what we call syntactical interoperability. It enables machines to share things, but just in the syntactical level. There is no explicit semantics. And RDF and OWL is in the semantic level. So we have a semantic interoperability because we have explicit semantics, a standard way to tell to the other machine what is the semantics behind the things I'm representing. The problem is, RDF is a model and a language, okay? It is a homogeneous way to represent things that we want machines to read. So it's a, a representation designed for machines, okay? And it works on the problems of semantic interoperability. So let's see this, the, the, the things. First, uh, how, consider we have uh, a page and we want uh, to find in this page something, uh, uh, an RDF description, okay? And this problem is interesting because uh, today people create mixed pages. For example, you can have an HTML page with RDF inside it, okay? But RDF is something independent. Is not mixed in the format and nothing else. So it's easy for the machine to find, read, and interpret the RDF. The second thing is, for example, consider I want to find a book about biology. How a machine can know that some specific book is from biology? We use what we call ontologies. I will define that, but we can you can start from the notion of taxonomies I showed you, and we can extrapolate that to something much more complex 
in which we define relations among things. Okay? And uh, the, the things we represent is independent from the format, this, the shape, because we are not, uh, is not de defined uh, uh, to, is not based in the visual interpretation of things. Okay? Uh, okay, so the model RDF is a way uh, to represent things uh, in, in the RD, in express. Uh, RDF expression. So consider the following. We have XML, but XML, as I told you, is hierarchical. Okay? So, since RDXML is hierarchical, the RDF model is mapped to XML. Okay? So we map something to something else. And that's it. Okay? And uh, uh, today it's better to know the following. It's not a good idea try to understand RDF from XML. It's not a good idea. Because we tell that, I showed you that RDF can be represented in several ways. Okay? The better way to understand RDF is a graph. And XML is a kind of just support to represent it. You map it to XML. Okay? And OWL share with the RDF the same graph model. In fact, in fact, I must tell you a sad story now. In the beginning, for me, there is no way to split OWL from RDF because they both share the same model and OWL uh, it started as a kind of complement complement of RDF. Okay. Now the OWL community is defining a new model for OWL, okay, which is different and is mapped to RDF. <laughs> and I tell you that is a sad story because it's becoming too complex. <laughs> Okay, I, I I like this model, which everything is a graph. It's much easier to 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 work with, and we will work with this model, which is still even in the new specification is valid. And this graph can be mapped to XML, but you can also get the graph and put in the database. Okay, so now we have native. RDF database and native RDF database they don't use XML okay they don't use XML because in the past people think oh if you want to put RDF in a database you need an XML database no it's not a good idea to store RDF in an XML database and I can show you several reasons to that okay if you want to store RDF in a database the best approach to have an RDF database or a graph database because RDF is a graph okay and you can tell me okay but if you get for example Neo4j Neo4j is a property graph which is different from the RDF graph but in fact a RDF graph is simpler than a property graph it means that I can put the RDF graph in the Neo4j I don't use the properties, just that. I mean, so you can store your RDF graph in the Neo4j if you wish. Okay? But nowadays we have some, for example, you have Virtuoso. And, and, and the, the plan was, you, I, I see if I show you Virtuoso. Virtuoso is a native RDF database. So it's a graph database specialized in RDF. Okay? And we have also N3. N3 is a representation of uh, RDF for humans like you. Okay? Poor and mortal humans. Okay? Okay. So.